All right, well, good morning. Uh, today's uh, presentation, uh, Field Clearing or Indigenous uh, Stone Pile. Uh, this was prepared by James and Mary Gage, but I am presenting the material that, we, that we've worked on. Uh, basically, uh, the simple rock pile, carn, stone mound, stacked stone feature is at the center of a very contentious debate, as we all know, over whether these are farmers' field clearing piles or indigenous ceremonial stone structures. The fact is both sides are technically correct. Field clearing piles exist and so do indigenous stone mounds. This presentation gathers together everything currently known about identifying and distinguishing field clearing piles from indigenous ceremonial mounds. It will discuss specific characteristics of each, all of which would derive from decades of historical and field research. There is abundant evidence from historical records and period photographs that New England farmers built field clearing piles. Mm -hmm. We're not doubting that. Mm -hmm. It's not either or, or, you know, or one side or the other. We, we acknowledge that. There's abundant evidence from historical accounts and tribal oral histories. And when I get to indigenous stone miles, I'll go into a little bit more detail about specific tribal history on stone structures and even archaeological excavations that indigenous peoples in New England constructed stone piles as part of their spiritual beliefs. These are two scientific facts which are indisputable. This leaves us with the task of trying to distinguish between stone piles built by these two different cultures. This is a major challenge because over 70% of the tribal lands in southern New England were converted to Euro-American agricultural and livestock farming. Therefore, it is common to find indigenous structures on old farms. Field clearing. What do farmers do with the stones they clear from the fields? They were used for it. Here are some uh, things that they were used for, and I'll We'll go through them and then I'll talk about a little bit about each one. All right, stone walls, wide disposal walls, building foundations, road repairs, subsurface drains, other construction projects like dams, filling in wetlands to uh, create more farmland, dumping into ravines, field clearing piles. Stone walls. Farmers in New England and New York built over or close to 300,000 miles of stone walls, according to a census, 1870 U.S. Census. A lot of the stones were taken from farms, from farm fields ending up in stone walls. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that number, 300,000. Why disposal walls? I know we've seen a lot of these uh, in some places, uh, but they have uh, perplexed uh, met people for a long time. There was a simple explanation for these kind of walls being wide. Uh, they were anywhere from 3 to 15 feet wide. And in the 1800s farm journals, farmers described building wide disposal walls to get rid of rocks from their crop and hay fields. What they did, they would build two parallel walls anywhere from 3 to 15 feet apart. They'd take the, uh, the stones from the field, in their cart, back it up to the wall, dump it in the section of the wall, nice and neat and tidy to get the stones uh, out of the field. Road repairs. Before modern asphalt roads, people had to deal with dirt roads. Muddy sections could be a major problem. One solution was to fill these muddy sections with these stones. Occasionally, you can still find examples in the woods. Building foundations. Uh, this particular foundation was documented recently in Ashway, Rhode Island. It's a bond foundation. Stones with flat faces could be used for building foundations. This is just a few examples of the practical uses for field stones. When farmers offered advice to other farmers in their newspapers about field clearing, they repeatedly talked about combining field clearing with some practical project like building walls or repairing roads. 
Now, the reason you don't see a lot of legitimate piles, field clearing piles on old farms is because stones were used for various construction projects and plus farmers wanted to get these stones out of their fields so that they could plant their crops, make some money, feed their family. What did farmers, uh, did farmers build field clearing pies? Obviously the answer is yes. To really understand the subject of field clearing, we need to dig a little deeper and ask more questions. Where did these the farmers put their piles of stones. Now we're going to go through these and then we're going to talk a little bit about each one. Along field edges, very common. Corn a corner of the field, common. Also where two stone walls would meet, they put stones in that section. A row between, a single pile in the middle of the field, a row between two fields and multiple piles in a field. It's rare, but it does happen. Here's the first one here. Uh, this 1941 photograph shows a large field clearing pile, a pile of stumps. Here's the, all the stones and here's the stumps and here's where they're growing their crops right here. This was a convenient and common place to make field clearing piles. This is a, a modern example in my town of Rochester, Massachusetts. This is an edge of a cornfield. And this uh, particular uh, row of stones is about 35 feet long, six feet high. Next to it, about 200 feet to the right of this picture is another 35 foot, six, six feet high row of stones. Uh, so again, uh, cornfield, lots of cornfields in Rochester. Between two fields, this 1922 photo from a New York farm was used as an example of bad farm management. This 20 foot wide linear mound of stones was between two fields. The pile was taking a substantial amount of land out of agriculture production, resulting in a loss of income for the farmer. This is another place to look for field clearing piles. In Rochester, we also have uh, one of these stone rows that divides two fields or it could, or it could divide two uh, pieces of property but we have we have one it's a, probably about 150 feet long and probably 20 feet wide this example single pile in the middle of the field also from my town of rochester this is in the middle of a cornfield and in the background you can see uh, is a cranberry bog there as well this is another common place to dump stones in a, in a single pile in the middle of the field. Farmers still do this today. Again, uh, modern field clearing piles tend to have dirt mixed in, as you can see. Lots of dirt and stone mixed in, and that was because the farmer used a rock picker attachment to his tractor, and that's why it looks the way that it does. Group of field clearing piles, headaches. This 1915 photograph of an Alabama cotton field shows a boy with a mule struggling to maneuver a plow around a few stumps left in the field. Imagine, just imagine a field full of rock piles, 10 to 20 feet apart, close to each other. That would be even more difficult. Most farmers, as I said, get rid of the stones quickly from their fields so that they could plant their crops, maybe make some money, feed their family. Now there is historical evidence that farmers did occasionally build groups of stone piles in their crop and hay fields. Both of these types of fields had to be plowed in order to seed them. Farmers quickly found out the hard way that having lots of rock piles in their field was a complete pain in the rear end in plain English. This is a 1937 photo of a Michigan potato field there were a number of stone piles as you can see them were up against stumps that can be seen these piles were formed by tossing rocks on them and you will notice they are generally similar in size I want you to remember that similar in size and shape these are determining factors for field clearing versus indigenous stone structures 
This is a photo of a 1922 hayfield on a New York farm. We see the same basic characteristics here. Piles of similar size, shape, and the piles are spread out roughly equally distant from each other. This caption of the photo complains that of the loss of land and waste of labor created by this practice. Now, it wasn't unusual for farmers to put piles of stone in their field together and then hastily, you know, with this concentration of stone where it is to get it off the field to place it someplace else. All right, recap. If the only piles you find are along the field edges, in the corner of a field where two, where two stone walls meet or a single pile in the middle of a field, it is field clearing. A field full of rock piles is more challenging to evaluate the two historic photos we just saw offer three useful characteristics, okay? Determining factors in field clearing. One, field clearing piles all have the same design. They are similar in size and roughly equally distant from each other. Indigenous stone mounds. How do we know what is an indigenous stone mound? We have several sources here. One is detailed analysis of over 11,000 documented stone structures, mostly stone mounds from dozens of sites, anthropological information from outside New England about the construction of indigenous stone structures, which means study of other cultures from different areas, some limited archaeological data from New England, example Freetown, Carn excavation by uh, 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 Maver and Brian Dix back in the 70s. Archaeological data from outside of New England, especially in the Great Lakes region, and also discussions with tribal representatives. Now this is where I want to talk about stone walls and stone structures. Harvey Buford, Rick Prescott, myself sat down with the Tribal Preservation Officer of the Narragansett Tribe in 2014. My first question to him was, I said, John, what is the story with all these stone walls and stone structures that we find here in Rhode Island? And he said, quote, Steve, my people, my people have worked with and in stone for thousands of years. So that's tribal, oral tribal history. And as we talked about the 300,000 mi uh, 300, miles of stone walls, this information that I'm going to give you is from a book called Talking Walls by Matt Boer. He says between 1620 and 1750, no stone wall building happened. The reason for that, uh, uh, plenty of wood, plenty of timber. They would pen their animals you know, from this wood, divide their property. So th the first three or four generations, no stone wall building. Now, according to William Hubble, the golden era of stone wall building began 1750 to 1850, after the Revolutionary War and prior to the invention of barbed wire, along with the abandonment of farms. Then we had the decline and destruction after agricultural prices finally crashed during the Panic of 1873, along with the new train system and opening of the Erie Canal in 1825, long distance inexpensive transportation of cheaper goods from newly opened western areas was made possible. So now you have all these goods coming in from the west because of the Erie Canal and the train system. So the farmers in New England where the soil is really terrible, just eking out a living, said, you know what? It's time to go. So many of them just, up, you know, uh, left, went out west where the land was fertile, more opportunity uh, to make some money. So looking at the general timeline of, of the history of New England, Stonewall building, according to these experts, we are roughly given 100 years or less for the creation of 300,000 miles of Stonewall building. I'm going to tell you, it's an impossibility. I mean, you can, you can say I don't agree with you, and that is your right to do so. But we don't give enough credit to the indigenous population for knowing how to work stone in stone and use stone for thousands of years. 
we, again, as part of the, that the gentleman said, uh, we've got to correct the error that they were really uh, intelligent people. All right. As previously mentioned, field clearing piles tend to be similar in size and shape. In contrast, groups of Native American stone mounds, I like to use the word indigenous, uh, are generally characterized by a diversity of different designs, styles, sizes, patterns, and shapes within a group of structures. Let's look at some of these different designs. Here's one right here. Split stone structure. Uh, these are common at ceremonial stone landscape sites. This one has a mound of stones on top of the boulder. Here's another design. Split stone structures show a variability uh, in the upper left, as you can see, stones inside the split and attached to two sides of the split boulder. The lower right, no stones inside. Instead, stones are placed on top of both halves of the boulder. Another indigenous design. Split wedge, right here. Uh, in, a, in a spring with two stones uh, wedged inside this uh, split boulder. And if you notice, just take a look at the area itself. This certainly isn't farmland. It certainly isn't pasture land either. So, and anyway, where, uh, where the springs are places where water from the underground underworld came to the surface, it is not difficult to imagine why this might be a ceremonial important place. This is a split bedrock. Naturally occurring splits in bedrock were also utilized. Two small stones, one here, one there, were wedged into this uh, exposed outcrop. This is part of a small ceremonial stone landscape in Gloucester, Massachusetts. This cannot be mistaken for field clearing. Another design, vertical wall structure on top of boulder with interior fill. This structure was built on top of a boulder. It has vertical walls of large stones that contains an interior fill of small stones. Now what people don't realize is that uh, animals have no problem walking in and, and around and, and with stones, no matter how large they are. So. This here, uh, you have uh, larger stones and then the small stones on the inside. Again, size, you're gonna, we're going to see this again. Size of stones is a determining factor concerning indigenous structures, how you can tell the difference. Rock stack. This is a two stone rock stack. To keep stacks properly balanced, two thin shim stones were wedged under the bottom stone. These small details can be important to analyzing a site. Again, a farmer is not going to waste his time with two stones, almost the same size as the base stone, uh, just trying to make his property look good. He would have been better off just leave it where the stones were because they would have been of no hazard or impediment either to man or beast. This uh, single layer of stones on top of the boulder, this structure has 11 stones in a single layer on top of the boulder. Note how small some of the stones are. They also appear to be in some kind of arrangement. Again, size of stones, very important. Again, a farmer is not going to waste his time trying to, you know, when he's trying to uh, feed his family, fight for survival, uh, to go out in the woods and say, honey, I'll be back in a little while. I'm going to arrange some stones. Indigenous design. Mound on ground. Circular and oval mounds of stone placed on the ground are common. This one was in the process of being documented. And just a little uh, side note. Uh, when we go out into the field, it's important to, f to find out whether these are natural or possibly manipulated. So there's a process that I call recovery. We take a leaf blower lovingly, gently, calmly, respectfully, just to see what's underneath. And if we figure it's, um, it's been manipulated, then we take lots of photographs from all different sides. We take measurements, we take GPS points, and then when we're finished with each visit, wherever it is, I take a video. 
of all the structures and how they were documented. And this helps the people looking at this information to analyze it correctly, make some comments, and everything we do after each visit is sent to the tribes. They're in the loop 100% all the time. This is a beautiful one here. Vertical wall mound on ground. Some mounds built on the ground can be quite impressive. This example has an exterior vertical wall holding back stones inside of it. It is in excellent condition and there are no loose stones around the base of the structure. It took time and skill and effort to build such a mound to hold up so well. Again, now I could, some people could say, well, the farmers put all that stuff there. If they did, they would have just thrown it in the middle and then uh, somewhere along the line, gotten it together and taken it out, put it in some place. But this shows deliberate intent. This took a lot of time. And again, a farmer fighting for survival is not gonna waste his time. Repeated patterns. Here's two examples uh, on top of a boulder by the structure site is, is fairly common. Uh, were these the work of a farmer walking through his land, picking up stones? I don't know. But one way to evaluate this question is to look for repeated patterns. These two examples come from the same site. A triangle stone was chosen in both cases, suggesting that triangles have some sort of meaning or symbolism. It is a good indication these aren't random. This leads us to the next characteristic sometimes seen with indigenous stone work intentional construction. Some indigenous stone mounds exhibit clear evidence of intentional construction. In this case, symbolism was incorporated in the form of three triangular stones, one here, one here, one here, leaning up against the base stone. This is obviously highly unusual, uh, but let's look at something more common. Again, intentional construction. This structure contains only five stones, but they are very carefully stacked. Anyone who has worked with stones knows that trying to stack these types of stones so they remain stable takes effort and skill. You just can't throw this together. Again, a farmer fighting for survival would have just left the stones where they were or put them to the side of the, uh, his property. And if, he left, and if he just left them there by the boulder, no hindrance or impediment to animals. All right, I want, you, I want you to look at this, this photograph. This is, this is a photo, this is a good one. Size of stones. This 1941 photo shows a farm in New York State with a farmer harrowing his field in preparation for sowing winter rye crop. Okay, what is wrong with this photo? Did you notice all the rocks in the field? Farmers as a general, again, size of stones, farmers as a general rule didn't bother to remove small stones from their field. Some of the rocks in this photo are as much as nine inches long. So this, that a myth about, well, everything's gonna be cleared out of the field so I can plow. They're plowing, you know, they're, they're planting. If, if they can put a seed in the ground, they, they're gonna do it. Small stones. Here is where the size of stones farmers pulled from their fields became really important. If you find a stone mound with lots of stones, less than six to nine inches in size, there was a real good chance that it is a ceremonial structure. Even if you find it on an old farm. This example in this photo comes from the 18, from an 1800s farm in Rhode Island. It's part of a large ceremonial stone landscape. Another example, association with non-utilitarian structure. That's just another fancy name for uh, of no practical use to the farmer or the homestead. Uh, this is common uh, to find in groups of ceremonial stone mounds associated with uh, these structures. Uh, take for this, uh, this example here, you have a niche this was two feet long, a foot wide, and uh, very uh, too small for any kind of livestock and impractical for chickens. So therefore, it's not farm related. 
Another example, enclosures. Another common example is the enclosure. Enclosure uh, come in a number of different sizes and shape. This is a typical U-shaped design found throughout New England and New York. It's just big enough for one person. There is no evidence that it was ever used as a fire pit. Again, if this was built by the farmer, he, he must have had a lot of time on his hands because these stones here, he could have just left them like they are, but more than likely he would have uh, either left them there or just moved them uh, to the side of a field. Standing stones can be a bit trickier. Sometimes they were used by settlers to mark property boundaries. This pair of stones is in Massachusetts and helps to orient the viewer toward the winter solstice sunrise. All right, characteristics of indigenous stone mounds. Again, most indigenous stone mound groups are characterized by a diversity of designs, styles, pattern, sizes. Most, but not all, ceremonial landscapes have split stone structures. Uh, most indigenous stone mound groups are associated with non-utilitarian structures like niches, standing stones, not property boundary markers, enclosures, perch and pedestal boulders, dolmens, chambers, not root cellars, modified rock shelters, petroglyphs. So, some mounds, let's see, some mounds within a group may exhibit intentional construction, which in most cases indicates it's indigenous. However, stone mounds with small stones less than six to nine inches in size are not field clearing, they're indigenous. So hopefully, um, both New England farmers and New England peoples built rock piles for very different reasons. After decades of field and archival research, we're beginning to have a better understanding of how to identify stone structures built by each culture. It is hoped that the summary of this research has proved useful. And once again, stone walls, there are many beautiful walls that you could definitely tell were built by the colonist. But a lot of the stone walls were already here when the colonists came in 1620. So let's make sure we give uh, our due give our credit to the great uh, people, the indigenous people, wh wherever they are, because they were very talented. They had a structured society. In fact, in many cases, uh, uh, they were, uh, I, probably, I think they probably put the fear of God into the colonists when they came because they were so organized. They had uh, a great way to, uh, to, you know, to, to worship. They took great care of the land. They never abused anything. They utilized what they needed, and then they moved on. So. I am very fortunate uh, in these past 14 years being in the field to have documented these structures. And again, not everything I document is, is indigenous and not, and not everything is, is colonial. But uh, hopefully looking at these uh, differences between the two, I think we're better able to now when we see something say, well, yes, that is probably uh, indigenous and, and uh, or... Thank you. Thank you very much.